we were a symbiotic couple of, of the highest order because of our disabilities. She was my eyes and I was her arms and strength. I'm Dave Barr and my new book, Crave, The Adventures of the Blind and the Real, has just been released and I'm an author and a speaker. So, Prave is a combination of two things. It's a made up word between my late wife, Priscilla Carlson, and me, Dave Barr. So, Priscilla and Dave. Prave, according to Urban Dictionary, also means proud and brave. Priscilla taught me to be a better self-advocate. I'd been a self-advocate because I have to get what I need. I always had to ask for something, whether it's a braille book, whether it's getting help reading mail. I always had to ask. I got fed up with asking. I'll just do it myself. Well, you can't. Being blind, you're always dependent on somebody. Does not matter how isolated you make yourself. Eventually, you have to be dependent on somebody to help you out who has eyes. In the book are humorous stories about, you know, people that were idiots and ignorant and showed it. There were also mistakes we made as a couple. We're not perfect. I want people to just say they had disabilities, they made them, you know, work together. So when I speak, a lot of it is humor, a lot of it can be self-deprecating, but it's a way to say, hey gang, life's not all that bad. Okay, everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Nice to have everyone with us. Dave is here with us today. We're going to be talking about his book, uh, Inspiring, Not an Inspiration. And that's one thing we're going to be talking about in today because something came up that Dave shared with me, a TED Talk that he's going to talk about that really challenged me when we talked about this. But Dave, welcome to the podcast. Nice to have you here. How are you? Well, hi. And hello, world, as they put on forums or whenever it said hello world in the DOS days or whenever. Uh, do they still do that? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm a squirrel. Hi, I'm Dave Barr and I'm a squirrel. Um, great introduction, right? Um, thank you, first of all, for having me on the show. It's great to be here. I saw your podcast, listened to a couple episodes and was like, oh yeah, this guy's cool. Thank and you. we did a pre-interview. So I guess I should tell you guys, everybody, about myself. Yes, we'd love to know more. Dave, tell us a little bit about you. First of all, where are you in the world? And then a little bit of your backstory would be great. I can do that. So I am in Colorado, where it does not snow 365 days of the year, as some people think. Just FYI. Uh, And the baseball team is always bad. (laughs) uh, (laughs) I'm a baseball fanatic. I am totally blind, and I have been since birth, so this is the only life that I have ever known, and I am fine with it. Um, I grew up going to mainstream public schools, uh, K through 12. I went to the University of Denver for a few years and then transferred to CU Boulder, that's the University of Colorado Boulder, where I got a bachelor's in psychology and a master's in historical musicology. Uh, My thesis was on two doo-wop record labels of the 1950s and which one was better than the other, basically. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun. A lot of people came to my presentation, so that was cool. Um, In 2011, I met my wife, Priscilla, who had brittle bones, and she and I were married for about three years or so. And uh, unfortunately, she passed away. in 2017 from a brain aneurysm. It was very sudden. Um, And I started writing a book after that. I do, now I do disability advocacy presentations like the one you're listening to or watching now. And I do accessibility consulting for companies to look at their websites and see how user-friendly and accessible they are. There is a difference between those two. Um, And I've been doing that for, I guess, about five years. It took me a while to write the book. And um, I started a company called Insightful Living, which I put a hyphen between in and sightful. I don't really know why. I think it was just that I thought it was fun. <laughs> um, or the other, if the full domain was taken. I don't remember. Could be. Um, but I thought it was kind of cool to have like insight and then insight without the hyphen. And I was like, no, I'll put in dash sightful living.com is, is the website. Um, 
I wrote a book called Brave, which is Priscilla and Dave and Proud and Brave, because I liked it. So the full title is Brave, The Adventures of the Blind and the Brittle. Obviously, I'm the blind one, and she was the one with brittle bones, osteogenesis imperfecta, also called OI. So if I talk about OI, I'm talking about brittle bones. Okay. Um, Priscilla was a force of nature in the best way possible, and we had a great relationship. You know, did we have disagreements? Of course we did, but we read each other very well. We finished each other's sentences. We um, met at this at the accessibility lab in in Boulder, uh, the Disability Services Center, and I talk about that in my book. It's it's a fun story. Um, I wrote the book. First of all, you know, looking back, it's it's kind of like, why did I write it? Well, since this is an author's podcast, um, I self published it. It's on Amazon. There is an audible version of it uh, that I narrated. That was an interesting experience. And um, I learned a ton about myself, but a ton about self-publishing and writing and audiences and stuff. And I guess if I had to be honest, I wrote the book as a catharsis. I needed a way to get my thoughts and grief out. Um, it's a pretty, it's, it's not a long book. It's about a three or four, four-ish hour read. Um, the publishing com self-publishing company I went with recommended, you know, write a book that somebody can read on the plane ride from Denver to New York. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's about four hours. And so it's about, it's about what I've written. If you happen to belong to the national library service for the blind and print disabled, uh, in the U S there is a version on there narrated by Joe Wilson, who did a good job, actually. Um, I didn't know it was going to be there until somebody, uh, one of my other blind friends was like, your book is on Bard, which is a Braille audio reading download service. Um, I got her thing. She just said, your, your book is on Bard. Did you know that? No. <laughs> and she's like, it's not narrated by you. And I looked, narrated by Joe Wilson. Joe Wilson's a good narrator. Um, he did, he did a good job, really. Um, it's always, it, it was, it's, it's flattering to know that my book is up there with books read by, you know, Alexander Scorby and Robert Sams and boy, Guy Sorrell, uh, Roy Avers, you know, all these great narrators for the Talking Book Library over the years. Um, so that, that was, that was a trip. That was really cool. Um, but yeah, I, I wrote the book to process. I wrote the book not only to process and share a love story, but I also wrote the book, which is what I'll focus on today, about disability advocacy and what Priscilla and I went through as people with disabilities, um, how we dealt with certain situations, you know, buying a house, getting married, um, all these things that, you know, I had great stories. I have a, a I had a great writing coach and she said, you know, you have all these good stories. You're a very good writer, but you know, we need to tie it together. Okay. So we started thinking and she's like, well, what about disability advocacy? So in the book, there are, you know, just bits of things that you can do as a person maybe who does not have a disability has never interacted with a person with a disability. Um, and just, it was, it was fun to write, honestly. It, it was fun. It was challenging. The covers, I've been told, very beautiful. It won a, a couple of, uh, the book won a couple of awards at an independent publishers, uh, Colorado Independent Publishers Association um, thing in 2019. So that was, that was gratifying. Um, one for editing and cover design. So, you know, just, it, it, I, it was a process, but it was a good process. I'm it's a, like I said, it's a pretty raw book. It's not a kid's book. Don't read it to your children, please. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your small children. There's, there's a fair bit of profanity in there. Um, that's how we talked. I yeah. wrote it as we talked. Yeah. And, you know, Priscilla has a brother who is in the Navy. Hence, he cussed like a sailor. <laughs> well, 
so did she. Um, and I do. And I, some people, oh, that's not professional. Sorry, but that's how I wanted to write it. It's a very conversational book. Most people that know me as they were reading it were like, oh, that's totally Dave. Oh, that's yeah. totally Chris. Yeah. You know. Um, but yeah. Where else are we going? Um, I like this. No, this is great. Can you tell, before you met Priscilla, way back younger in your younger years, would you ever have considered writing a book back then? Or was this more out of your relationship with Priscilla? Question. Um, I don't think I would have. Okay. I don't think I would have done this. I wouldn't have done probably what I'm doing now if it weren't for Priscilla. Um, it, she and I had talked about writing a book together. We had ideas in a, in a Word doc about what we, what we would write about. And so mm -hmm. after she died, it was like, you know, she would want me to write something because she liked my, my writing as well. Um, it's always nice to, to know that. Um, but, you know, a book, eh, probably not. I, I didn't think I had a lot to share. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but, you know, Priscilla was really the, the person who got me onto this path in a good, in a good way. Um, yeah. I'd like to know more about Priscilla. Can you give us some insight on her as a person? I, she seems to be somebody that would be uh, a joy to have met. Can you talk about her a little bit more for us, please? Oh, yeah. I could talk about her for days. Um, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, she lived for 29 years in a small town in North Dakota, Park River. It's way up in the Northeast area by uh, Canada and Minnesota. Um, and then a friend of hers that also has osteogenesis and perfecta lived in Colorado. They met and basically said, hey, you know, you should move out here. And so she did. I'm summarizing quickly. Yeah. Um, and lived with them for a little bit, then moved in with a roommate. Then I came along in 2011. And then I moved in um, in 2000, actually late 2011, due to circumstances of, of a, an accident that I talk about in the book that she had. Yeah. Um, and then we did some coaching together. We went to the Coaches Training Institute classes. Those were awesome. Um, she was working for a nonprofit called JFK Partners, which they do lots of things related to a lot of intellectual disabilities and autism. Um, they are, I believe, internationally known. We went to some conferences in DC for them and had a poster put up about some of the stuff Priscilla was doing. Um, her last job was to to be the social media director for the uh, for JFK Partners. Uh, really beautiful person, physically, mentally, spiritually. Had a wicked sense of humor. Yeah. Um, you know, we teased each other, but in a, in a good natured way. Um, was two foot ten, and used a power wheelchair. Um, <laughs> quick story about using a power wheelchair. I don't know if I told this story in our pre-interview, but when Priscilla and I were at Coors Field, which is the Rockies baseball stadium, going to a game, one time, this only happened like once, twice within five minutes, two people at the security gates at Coors Field looked at me, and I don't think I had my guide dog at the time, looked at me holding on to Priscilla's chair and asked me something to the effect of, okay, if you can push her over here, that would be great. <laughs> two people did it. I, I, I don't know why. And both times we were like, um, well, because I just, you know, A, I don't know where over here is, and B, um, she drives herself like they didn't notice that she had her hand on a joystick yeah. moving the chair like did they think i you know was behind and pushed yeah uh no no I, you know could the can the chair be pushed manually yes but you know 
really. Only when we took it to the airport and unfortunately had to load it in the underbelly of the plane, uh, you have to you know, make sure they can push it. I get it. Yeah. But that was one of those, This I, I never forgot it. And that's not like, other than those two times, and I'm sure, I'm sure it was just people reacting to what they saw. Um, you know, I, I try not to get angry about things like that because they didn't know. Yeah. But at the same time, that one is a little on the like, wait, what? <laughs> Spectrum of things of like, wait, you didn't, you just saw somebody behind a wheelchair and made that assumption. Um, that said, course field people have actually been really great. They were yeah. some of the best security people and just the coolest people. Um, and we got to meet the the Rockies announcers one time, stuff like that. So, nice. I, like I said, I could talk about Priscilla for 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 days. I don't know anybody that that didn't like Priscilla Carlson. You nice. Know, I knew nobody that was like, ah, oh, that Priscilla. Oof, what a <laughs> you know, insert word here or whatever. You know, what a terrible person. No, no, she had a smile that could light up a room and uh, just a laugh that was, was that was always present. And um, we we made we made a great couple. We enjoyed each other's company and nice. we made each other laugh. You know, those are two two things that are, I think are key to any successful relationship. If you don't enjoy being around a person and you find yourself making all the jokes and they're just kind of going, ha-ha, then it's like, uh, hey, I'm just doing all the uh, talking and joking here. We've all had those types of relationships before, whether they're romantic or not. Um, so, yeah, that is a little bit about Crystal. I like it. So one thing we talked about, Dave, was you had mentioned a TED talk where the person speaking was talking about that I am not your inspiration. And I haven't had a chance to hear it yet. I'm working on getting around to getting into this because I really want to know more about this. But can you kind of summarize why this TED Talk means something to you personally around the idea of not being uh, inspiring, but, you know, that you that I'm not your inspiration. Can you kind of go on a little bit about this? I, I love your your thoughts on this. Yeah, so I'm not going to give away what this person really says in the TED Talk. Okay. Because it's great. And the late, great Stella Young, hi, New Zealand, um, did, a, did a TED Talk, and it is called I Am Not Your Inspiration. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, premise of it really being like we're just people you know yes we have disabilities but we are we are just people and i have and i think i put this in the intro to my book i've always had a problem this is me personally with you know people coming up to me when i'm eating or walking somewhere or whatever and just being like you're such an inspiration mm. It's happened. Yeah. And I'm just like, thank you. You know, um, I think I personally think there's a difference between being an inspiration and being inspiring. I would love to inspire you that are listening or watching this podcast to be more aware of people with disabilities. I don't feel, it just makes me feel weird being like, an inspiration and usually it's kind of said in a way that well frankly it's this let's i'm gonna just lay it out for you Good. the ted talk kind of talks about some of this um stella does a fantastic job of, of explaining these things um but another way to think about it is it's kind of sometimes when people say that maybe they don't even realize it but to me it comes off as, boy, I'm glad I'm not you. I couldn't do it. Mm. You know, I have had people come up to me. One person in particular say to me, I don't know what I would do if I was blind. I think I'd kill myself. And I quote. And I just was like, okay. Now we had been talking with this person for a while and we, he just came out with that and we were like, uh, 
uh, like, what do you say to that? What do you You respond? Yeah. Like, now that was one example, but it, it's just one of those things where it's, you know, it, when the TED Talks, it's, Stella calls it inspiration porn. Actually. Interesting. I I will say that. It's like people that enjoy this idea of just these inspirational people. And I say it purposefully like that because usually it's said in this kind of whispered tone. Um, You know, if I can inspire you to notice how a website looks or a fact that there's not alternative text on a picture or great, you know, but I just, I don't know, being an inspiration is something that's always kind of like, mm. um, for, the, for that kind of, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's condescending. So the TED talk is, is five minutes or so, five, six minutes. It's great. She had the same disability that Priscilla did. Uh, she passed away a couple of years before he did. Um, they, they knew each other a little bit, I think through Facebook, but nothing, uh, they didn't talk too much. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of my my thoughts on and being an inspiration, I guess. And, and I specifically say and inspiration. I think there's to my like I said to my mind, I think there there can be a difference. It's a it's a great thing, and I think Dave, I think that everyone listening, myself included, needs to understand the power of words, and to understand maybe that if we don't know what to say in a certain situation that we don't use throwaway words that don't bring value, right? I'd rather we learn from your perspective and and hear what you're saying, because then we can apply that in many different situations, many different people, and be a better ally and a resource than someone looking to be inspired. Yeah, exactly. In, In that condescending way. Yes, right. I'm I'm specifically saying it, and like I said, some people don't even realize it. But I I've had a you know, a friend of mine and I were both blind. We're in California, and this guy came up to us and was like, "You guys are so inspirational." We were like, "Thanks." Like somebody was just reading us the menu, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like they were just reading us the menu. We were sitting at the bar having beer or something, you know? And. <laughs> He actually ended up buying, I think, our appetizers or something. <laughs> I was like, nice. okay. I mean, it was nice, but it was kind of like, okay, thanks. And he didn't, he, he bought them and left. We didn't get to thank it, you know? Yeah. It was one of those things. Um, so, you know, it was kind of one of those, like, what do you do? Like, oh, okay, well, if you cover, ever comes back, you know, thank him for us. But <laughs> that, that was awkward because, you know, it was just like, we were just, two guys sitting in a bar, you know, having, a, like I said, having a beer. Um, I'll, I'll, I want to just qualify here. And that type of inspiration thing doesn't happen to me, I think, as much as it used to. Okay. Um, which, you know, is okay. I think for, ver- for various reasons. Um, people are more aware, I would say, than they used to be. Um, you know, I have an obvious disability and sometimes I do look like I need help. So if, you know, I look like I need help. Yes, I do need help, you know, sometimes, um, but I'm also really stubborn and really independent. So, you know, it, I don't want to be an inspiration just because, and Stella talks about this in the TED talk a little bit. Okay. A lot, but basically I don't want to be an inspiration because I got up and put my pants on today. Yeah. Right. Or that I got up and went to get my prescriptions at a Walgreens or, you know, just stuff like that. Yeah. That's the, that's where I kind of am like, okay, I'm just me. I, I just do what I do. So that, that's what I mean by that. Um, yeah. And the one thing we talked about too, Dave, was that you gave me out a stat around how many people um, have a disability of some Various degrees, but I was kind of shocked at the number. Can you talk a little bit about that? One in four people have a disability in the United States. Wow. One in four, 25%. 
it's online and it's probably more now because of the pandemic. Yeah. Because the pandemic gave people disabilities they didn't know existed. Um, more things are being recognized as disabilities, depression, anxiety is, is being more widely discussed as a, as a disability. Yeah. I can speak for myself. It can be disabling, <laughs> you know, I, I've had disabling, crippling depression. Yes, I said crippling on purpose. Mm. Um, you know, I couldn't do things because I was that depressed. It's happened. I'm not going to lie. Um, but yeah, one in four. So, you know, you get four people together. At least I'm talking just in the U.S. It's about the same all over the world. But you get four people together. One of them has probably some sort of disability. Whether they disclose it or not, that's very important. Yeah. Whether they disclose it or not. You are not legally obligated to disclose your disability. Right. Things like job interviews. Yep. Uh, I could go to a job interview and not even mention the fact that I'm blind. It wouldn't really do me a lot of good because I need accommodations because I'm blind. Yes. But you don't have to do that. And people that have so-called invisible disabilities, sometimes I don't want to speak for them, but from what I have noticed, so they have issues with, with that. What do I disclose? What do I not disclose? I'm not going to go on that because I don't feel I can speak for, for that category of people. Right. Stay in your lane, right? That's right. And the, I guess the one thing when I see, when, when I hear that, that quote, one in four, Dave, I'm just, it's, it's not as rare in our circles than we thought like it is right. more prevalent and we need to be more aware then than ever of of the people around us and be as accommodating and as uh and how again going back to the that whole thought of being an ally but also just understanding our role as fellow citizens what can we do for each other how can we be better right. humans in the big picture right being a person with a disability puts you in a minority which is being in the U.S. You know, a black person or mm. something, you know, someone yeah. like that, uh, or you know any any number of minorities. I am a minority. I am I am well aware of it, and I'm okay with that. Um, but yeah, I think it's you know more companies are having diversity, equity, and inclusion sectors, conferences, uh, you know, workshops. Um, please do more than just teach one class on that sort of stuff, which is usually what people do. Oh, well, we, we learned about this accessibility stuff in like three hour class. Yeah. yeah. That's happened before. Um, you know, but yeah, to, to recognize that I, you know, I might need extra help uh, knowing where a bathroom is or, or something like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's not as it's not in in. I'm gonna try that again. It's not seen as something that's quite so bad anymore, right? There's still a long ways to go, right? But there's more that people are discovering the internet's, you know, helped and hurt for those types of things. So that's the one thing we talked about too, Dave, was for websites and like for, for going online and, and going to websites, you know, um, yeah. like when I go on a website, it's easy. I can navigate, no problem. I can click here, click there. I, you know, I don't need to know what the image is because I can, see the image yeah. it's very simple yeah. for me and then that i then don't understand how important it is to do websites properly for everyone to be inclusive for all and i want to know i want to learn how to make my content available through the podcast or all those different areas that i reach out into the world i want to include everyone i don't want to leave anyone out of the conversation so from your perspective, can you kind of give us a little bit of insight on maybe we have listeners that are, are authors and they have a website. How can we make it better? How can we include and, and do our things better to help more people, Dave? 
So I'm going to focus this specifically for the blind. Okay. There's a lot more you could do for everybody. Things like including alternative text for image that need, images that need alternative text. Example, there's a photo of Dave. I'm just making this up. Yeah. You know, there's a photo of you, Dave, sitting um, on a bench in a park and there are trees behind you. That's yeah. alternative text. And it's very useful because right now we're getting AI attempted generated alt text, which is worthless. That says that reads that photo and says, photo may be an image of person, bench, trees, if we're lucky. Mm -hmm. Usually it's photo may be an image of person. Now I use, I should back up a little. I use what's called a screen reader to navigate websites. My computer talks to me very fast. And that's the name that I've given my Amazon Echo. So I just woke up. So <laughs> my PC talks to me very fast. We've all had that problem, right? Yes, 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 um, yes. Speaking of AI, my PC talks to me. I use uh, what's called a Braille display um, that puts electronic refreshable Braille under my fingertips. It's quite useful when I'm dictating. That's how I did probably two thirds of my book. Um, and I use Dragon Naturally Speaking because it's, it's faster um, to do things, to dictate emails and stuff. Does it make mistakes? Of course it does. Um, but anyway, getting back to, to websites, that's how I navigate. So I use just the keyboard. I don't use a mouse. Um, there are ways you can simulate mouse clicks, but I don't use a physical mouse. Um, really high level, couple of things you can do. One, images with alt text. If they're decorative, meh, maybe. You know, if you have a logo that you want described once on the site on your main page, cool, put it in. I, you know, that's my opinion. Two, headings. Headings are really important. Hierarchical headings in particular. Um, you know, just like you were taught in school probably to do an outline, you know, bullet, you know number one, right, what was it? Number one, Letter A, you know, Roman numeral one or something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, so same with headings. Have a structure of heading one, big picture. Heading two, a little bit smaller. Heading three, a little bit smaller picture. I see lots of websites that just have like heading fours, followed by heading ones, followed by heading twos. And it's like, why? It doesn't make logical sense. Um, as a screen reader user, I navigate by headings quite a bit. There are different ways to navigate. You can navigate by region. You can navigate by link. You can navigate by heading. You can navigate by form field. You can navigate by list. So many different ways to do it. The web is, is an ever-changing place. If you really want to get into it, gang, there is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, also called the WCAG, which is a massive constantly updated set of guidelines, seems like it's constantly updated, um, that are technical and go into the high and the, the, the why and how of how to make websites accessible. Um, you know, I'm not a coder. I know a bit of HTML, but can't write it. But I do know when I can't access something. Mm. Um, there's also use, there's also usability. So you can make a website completely and utterly accessible, but if there's something that's not usable, like bad alt text even, or, or, you know, there's, there's a, there's, there can be a line between the two, but, you know, I've been on websites that are great, except for, you know, they have, uh, I didn't, I did an audit for a website that had buttons that should have been links. Okay. They're coded fine. That the same thing happened, but they should have been coded as links, you mm. know, stuff like that. That's more usability. Um, but the accessibility would be, hey, this form isn't labeled properly. These headings aren't labeled properly. These buttons aren't labeled properly. Um, I just did a telehealth appointment and the buttons on the site were not labeled. So I was guessing at what buttons I was pushing. Wow. You know, yeah. um, stuff like that. So. There are small things you can do. I think a lot of people go, oh my God, accessibility is this huge thing. It can be. But one of the things that you and I talked about is retrofitting versus yes. taking it into the product. Yes. Okay, I'll talk I remember about what that. I mentioned. Yeah, yeah that's I remember great. what I mentioned this. You were like, wow. 
Okay, so what I tell people when I give presentations is bake accessibility into your product from the beginning so that you do not have to retrofit. Yes. Physical example. Uh, a company has been told that they do not comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. They need to put a wheelchair ramp in their building. That costs money. That costs labor. That How do we do that? Where do we put it? What kind of ramp? Do we need automatic doors? All these things. Um, that's, that's retrofitting as an example. Same thing with websites and, and mobile apps. Now, if you've got a site that's not really accessible, you have to go back and say, uh, what do we need to fix? And it costs money, it costs time, it costs you know labor. If you start out and say, boy, I want to make this website, I want to make this building accessible, you know, knowing that it's not going to be perfect. Don't think that accessibility is, is equals perfection because it doesn't, it always changes. You know, like I said, there's things on my website that I know are not accessible. Not proud of it, but it's true. Why, why should you do it? You know, need to get those fixed. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm aware of that. I've just right. been kind of busy. Um, so if you start out with the mindset of, I want to make this accessible to as many people as I possibly can. How do I do that? Well, you start out asking, and I think this is the most important part, you start asking people with disabilities once you start wireframing to look at your site, if right. not even before. Yeah. Talk about the plans for your site, map it out. Say we want to have these headings here, these buttons here, these text boxes here. What do we do to, to get things labeled? Do these need images? You know, if you have a map, if you have a roadmap of your website, ask people with disabilities. Get people with disabilities involved in your process from the beginning. There are companies out there that don't do that and think that certain plugins can just solve all their problems. They're called overlays. I do not like them. That's another topic for another time. Do not yeah. ever use an overlay, please. Um, Look it up. But otherwise, you have to retrofit. Otherwise, you get people coming in and suing you, saying, hey, Domino's, you're not accessible. They're yeah. accessible. No. No. Took a lawsuit. <laughs> yeah. Happens all the time. Um, there are other ways to try and do the lawsuit thing that I'm not going to get into that are not exactly kosher to put it mildly. Yeah. Um, but my thing is get people with disabilities on your project when you know you can. Even if it's like, hey, I do know a friend who's blind or hey Dave, uh, can you just look at this site? You know, um you're you're just starting out. Okay, maybe we can barter, you know? Like <laughs> I, I know that not everybody you know has the the money of a Google or an Amazon or, a, or or whatever, but there are ways you can make your website accessible without using overlays, but using HTML5. Um, try and avoid ARIA, please, unless you're doing custom widgets. But even then, oh god, don't like ARIA. Um, mm. You know, but what I'm getting at is it can be done. Yeah, and it can be done in a way that respects people and knowing that it's not going to be perfect is okay no website's perfect right so but having that mindset of gee i need to include accessibility from the beginning is so important i cannot stress it enough yeah and i love i love dave how you talk about making it part of your plans when you start and we go if we go outside and we we go from the curb level down to street level right. usually the sidewalks are cut so that wheelchair no accessible way. but also yeah. then a mother with a stroller benefits yep I was just um, about to say anyone right anyone benefits right. somebody from with a suitcase being... or a dolly exactly. or a trash right. a trash guy you know everyone and, benefits right and like those uh tactile bumps that that they have on on corners for um i think wheelchair and and cane users those those help me yeah uh, little they're called truncated domes you know, stuff like that, automatic doors, you know, things that benefit people 
and they don't even realize half the time they don't even realize they're there. Um, and just yeah, it it helps accessibility helps everybody. Universal design is another big thing um, mm. that I won't get into, but that's also important. Um, look it up. There's seven principles. What they are, I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah. Um, but universal design is 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 also something you can look as inspiration in a good way for your websites. Dave, talk a little bit about your audiobook because you caught me with that too. I'm I, I love audiobooks. For me, I can be doing something and have it play. Talk about it for you personally. Do you listen to audiobooks and tell us yes. about your audiobook? Uh yes, I do. I have about 270 books from the Talking Book Library on my phone. Most of them Good. are three in biography. Um I listen usually at two or two and a half times speed, which is what I do with podcasts as well. Uh, I listen to synthesized speech about 300 words a minute, maybe faster, depending on the synthesizer. Wow. Um, as far as like recording my audiobook, that was a process. That was a learning experience. Um, I'm proud with how it turned out. Some of it, I think, I could have done differently, but that's kind of how I feel about the book too, right? You know, some of it we look back and go, boy, when I when I read the book to do my audio book, I hadn't read it since I wrote it because wow. I I needed time I, to just let it sit. And about a year and a half after I put it out, I said, okay, I want to do it. I'm ready. What do I need to do? And I got in touch with my self-publishing people. They got in touch with Twin Flame Studios. They were great. It was remote. Um, I literally, since we're all book people, I recorded it in my closet <laughs> because Good. I needed a decent, not noisy, you know, echoey space. My my place is wood floors. You won't know that, and I'm just you know, it doesn't matter, but because they compress the the sound of the book. I don't sound as resonant, I don't think, on the audiobook, on the Audible site. Okay. Um, but as far as the actual process, I learned that I needed to perform the work. It wasn't enough just to read. You know, there are sections of it that I feel like I'm just reading and not narrating the story. Mm -hmm. We've all had bad narrators who are monotonous or they are really boring <laughs> and they sound like Eeyore, you know, or they're bother. really chipper all the time. <laughs> you can't be chipper all the time when you do your book. Yeah. You know, unless you're talking about happiness for 330 pages, right. even then, you know, but I realized that I needed to sit down with the book and read the chapters aloud and perform them. It was very difficult because I hadn't read it, like I said, since I wrote it. But it was, how do I want to say this line? How do I want to emphasize this word? You know, do I want to cut this out? Yes, I think I'll cut a little bit out. There's a little I cut. Not much, but a little. Yeah. Um, I asked my engineer about that he said i've had people who cut out whole chapters from their print book <laughs> it wasn't relevant you yeah know? it's if they're doing a textbook and whatever it was isn't relevant but you don't want to cut it out of the print version okay i cut a little bit out i won't tell you where but yeah a little bit mm. you wouldn't notice um but it it taught me you know i i love performing i i've always been kind of one to do to you know do comedy or just improv. I did some improv in college. I've done a little tiny bit of stand-up comedy. I've been told it could be a stand-up comic, but I don't know. Um, but I, I realized that this was different. Why? Because I was performing my life and Priscilla's life in the way that I wrote it. Right. And there were times I was reading it, not realizing that it was me that had written it and had gone through it. You know, I had to almost take myself out of myself, if that makes sense. Because, you know, there were times I broke down. 
because it's a tough book. You know, yes, yeah. there, there, there's, there's quite a bit of sadness in the book, but there's quite a bit of happiness too. You know, yeah. that was the other thing was like I had to balance. When do you go down on a word because it's kind of a sad thing? When do you go up on a word because it's really happy and you're really excited that this happened? Yeah, Any difference. Yeah. You know? Um. You know, again, it's perfect. No. Uh, are there things I could have changed? Yeah, but I don't regret it. I'm glad I did it. It was overall a lot of fun. It was an educational experience um, for for me to learn. You know, to learn who I was as a as a narrator. I've read. I I like reading stuff out loud. People say that I read things out loud very well, um, which is great. But when you're reading your own life and your own words, it's a whole different ballgame than you're reading somebody else's. Um, you know, for Memorial Day, I read a column by Ernie Pyle, the death of Captain Wasco, his most famous mm -hmm. column from World War II. Yeah. And I read it into um, a microphone and I put it out there on Facebook. I don't think it's public. But I did it because I wanted to do something for Memorial Day. Yes. And reading that, it's not a long column, but it took me four hours to read and edit the whole thing because I wanted to make sure that I got the right inflection on some words. And again, not perfect. There are parts I wish I would have changed, but I was like, you know what? It's the meaning. It's this thing, the idea behind it. It is a tough, tough column. There's no getting around it. It's a mm. tough, sad column because well, it just is. Go read it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, even that took time because you want to just see how you how you go about it. So doing the book, that was a couple months worth of, you know, twice a week recording sessions that were sometimes interrupted by lawnmowers, you know, <laughs> uh, stuff yeah. like that, you know, yeah. uh, or vacuum cleaners. Um, but it, I, I don't regret it. I, I'm, I'm proud of the way it turned out. Excellent. Dave, talk a little bit about your website. Um, people come to the website. Um, yeah. Who are you serving through the website? Who can you help? Let's talk a little bit about that as well. I can serve people that want to learn. I like um, that. The website, in hyphen sightfulliving.com, talks about the book. There's some blog articles. I need to write more. Um, it is a website for disability advocates, accessibility people, but people who want to learn more about, you know, what I'm doing right here, talking to your organization, talking to yeah. you as a person, um, wanting to learn more about accessibility. You know, I do consulting, uh, I do presentations like this, screen reader demonstrations, um, talking about the book, talking about my life. Uh, the website is sort of encapsulates all that, I think. Um, and it's a good website. And oh yeah, I'm gonna, another admission here. Um, it wasn't very accessible when I built it because I had somebody build it with the wrong WordPress theme. Mm. Until a friend of mine who works in accessibility uh, said, hey, um, there's some stuff that, that's not really accessible. And I wasn't, you know, I'm still learning quite a bit about accessibility now, but even when I did it, uh, it wasn't accessible. And she was like, can I, can I help you fix that? And she did. So now it is pretty accessible, not per not completely, but pretty accessible. Um, so that is the website and you know, there's a contact form there. Uh, if you know, and a link to, to schedule a call, if you want, please contact me first. Yeah. I've got a lot going on. I've got presentations. I've got a conference. I've got you know, things to do. Um, please contact me, but I would, I would love to help people that want to learn. Um, and if you've read the book, please leave a review on Amazon. Yes. That helps me tremendously. I do not read them. I've been told that there are a lot of good reviews of the book. Though. You know, uh, some people do. I've, I've decided really not to, to read them because I want people to be able to leave an honest 
their honest feedback. Um, and you know, if you really hate something about the book or you absolutely love something about the book and you want to contact me, okay. Yeah, please do. Uh, I wrote it. I wrote it, like I said, as a catharsis and to inspire people to be aware of people with disabilities. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. Well, Dave, you've given us an hour of your time, and I appreciate that. It's so kind of you to do this. Um, I, I, I really, when we had our pre-chat, I walked away from that just thrilled, A, that I have time with you in your calendar. You are a very busy person, but that you're so giving to to educate and and, and give us the tools to, to be more inclusive and, and help each other as human beings. And I really all, got, walked away with that. To help each other. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me on the podcast. The, the pre chat was great. We talked for like an hour and a half. <laughs> you know, I know. I didn't realize we talked for an hour and a half until we ended. And I was like, oh. <laughs> um, you're, you're, you just bring so much light, Dave, into the room. And I, again, we, we kind of joked at the beginning, but you're one of the Daves I know. And I'm proud yes. to know you and proud to, yep. to have you on my yep. show. Same here. Thank you so much. Awesome. Everyone, please go check out all the information included in the show notes, please go buy the book, gift the book to someone that would love to read this book. And always, as always, leave a re, leave a review of the book and encourage others to, to follow your lead and, and buy the book. So um, I know, uh, Dave, we're both thinking of Priscilla. Um, yeah. And uh, I know she'd be proud of you and proud of what you've done and have accomplished. And I know it's just the start. There's so much more for you to do in this world. And the fact that you're helping people one at a time, um, I love it. I love it. So thank you for sharing a little bit of your heart today. You are very welcome. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Awesome. Thank you for being part of Living the Next Chapter. Hey, look, at we're, we're having such a great time talking to authors around the world. If you are an author and you would like to be on this very show, I would love to talk to you. Livingthenextchapter.com, livingthenextchapter.com, livingthenextchapter.com is the best way to get in touch with us. There you'll find our social media and blah, 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 la-di-da, and such. You, author, soon-to-be author, new author, currently writing your book author, published author, we need you here. The seat's empty, microphone set up, we're waiting for you. Livingthenextchapter.com. We would love to have you on the podcast. Yeah, I am talking, I'm talking to you. Yeah, you should be here. See you at livingthenextchapter.com.